Yakuza is one of my favourite franchises. There are few series like it, and despite its troubles leaving Japan, it's managed to become incredibly popular worldwide. It's a bombastic series about big muscle men punching each other for the sake of their ambitions, but it's also about going to karaoke bars and singing with your adopted daughter. It's about government conspiracies and bureaucratic red tape, as much as it's about RC cars and baseball. I love how complex and ridiculous the plots are. Combined with some of the most earnest and enjoyable writing in the industry, Yakuza is a beast unto itself. So recently, I decided to go back to where it all started, to see if I could relive the magic of experiencing these games for the first time again. That's when I got the bright idea, why don't I chronicle my experience? These videos aren't going to come out on a specific schedule, and I don't know how far I intend on taking them, but I hope you follow me along for the ride. So let's go back to that fateful Christmas in 2005, as we look back on Yakuza 1. Created and published by Sega in 2005, Ryu Gagotoku, named Yakuza in the West, was a completely new title in their lineup. The game was created by Sega New Entertainment R&D team, headed by Toshihiro Nagoshi. While you may now know Nagoshi as the Chad who looks like an actual Yakuza and poses for photos on thrones, at the time he was the creative head behind the Monkey Ball series. Originally announced under the name Project J, Yakuza had a very distinct style that stood out amongst Sega's catalog. It was intended to be gritty and violent, with a heavy emphasis on story. The game was based in Tokyo, with locations lovingly modelled after real areas. If you want to learn more about the development of the game, I'd highly recommend watching Yakuza fans Forging the Dragon, because it's a wild story. Nagoshi and the team would go out to host bars for research. The most important things for Nagoshi seemed to be accuracy. He wanted the game to be not only accurate to Tokyo, but also to the seedy underbelly of the Yakuza themselves. The game did well enough that it managed to secure a port to the west, and a sequel within a year of its release, and the rest is history. So how much has the series changed in these 17 years? The Yakuza series can be split into eras, usually based on what engine they were made in or consoles they were released for. Each era has a very distinct look and feel. It's very easy to tell the difference between a game made in the Dragon Engine, like Judgment, versus a PS3 era game like Yakuza 4. The era that stands out the most, in my opinion, is the original duology. Yakuza 1 and 2 were the only entries to be released on PS2, and they have a unique look all to themselves. The original Yakuza can only be described as gritty. The fixed camera angles make Kamurocho feel much bigger. You look down on Kiryu being dwarfed by the giant buildings of Theatre Square, and the lighting makes everything look darker, especially at night. A lot of the series' defining features begin right here, but it's clearly trying to find its feet. The cutscenes have a cinematic edge to them. Kiryu takes on hundreds of Tojo clan goons all by himself, and it will feel very familiar to anyone who's played one of the later games. But there's a feeling that I miss from these early entries. Yakuza games exist on a spectrum from serious to comedy. Often they'll fly wildly back and forth along the spectrum depending on the situation or whatever characters are on screen. But Yakuza 1 is told surprisingly straight. It definitely has its moments where it feels more like a modern entry, but for the most part, the story is told with unapologetic melodrama. It's a game that takes itself as seriously as possible, and that's something I've always loved about this series. No matter what happened five minutes before it, the writers know how to pull your heartstrings moments later. There's another major aspect of the game's identity that stands out when you look at the franchise as a whole, and that's the music. The original Yakuza soundtrack is a mix of a couple of different styles, primarily rock, jazz, and electronic. 
The result is an OST that immediately brings me back to the grittier style of the PS2 entries. I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but at some point in the franchise during the PS3 era, the jazz influence was dropped in favour of a, in my opinion, more generic style, and nowadays we're at the stage where even the guitars have been dropped in favour of full-on dubstep in some instances. This isn't to completely dismiss the later soundtracks, I think they have their place, but when you listen to tracks like Funk Goes On, Scarlet Scar, Intelligence for Violence, and then listen to their equivalent versions in the Kiwami remake, I truly believe they're missing something that made the original version so good. While the battle themes do deserve special mention, there's one song that I think is criminally overlooked, Unrest. This song acts as the game's overworld theme, and it plays everywhere you go in Kamurocho. Its title is absolutely spot on. There's something eerie about it, and it adds to the feeling of Kamurocho being a dangerous, dirty city. That low bass line with the repeated noises, and then you get the piano kicking in if you walk around long enough. I never get sick of hearing it, no matter how many replays I do. Everything from the way the game plays, to how it sounds, and how the story is told, it's a style that I'm very fond of. And while I love the newer entries just as much, I always wonder what it would have been like if they had continued with this style into the PS3 era. However, there's another thing the original has, something that the franchise has only recently attempted again, and if you know anything about Yakuza on PS2, it's probably this. I am of course talking about the English dub. Then step the fuck up, it's time to die. Yakuza was released in Japan during December 2005, and took about 9 months to make it to the West. It had already been a huge success in its home country, so Sega of America wanted to ensure that it would see similar success in the North American and European regions. This involved two things, funding a decent marketing campaign, and dubbing the game in English. These decisions almost buried the franchise in the West before it could even get off the ground. The first trailer released for this version apparently contained an early cut of the audio, and was very poor quality, giving people an immediate wrong impression of the game. Until the day he took a fall for family and broke the blood oath of Yakuza. This trailer was shared around game sites of the time, and combined with news that it would only ship with the English dub, the game began developing a poor image. The disc apparently couldn't fit both voice tracks on it, and considering the cast list Sega hired for the dub, they probably assumed this wouldn't be a problem. I promise you, I have not made this list up. You have to trust me. We have John DiMaggio playing Kashiwagi, Michael Madsen of Tarantino fame as Shimano, Bill Farmer, aka Goofy, as Date, and the Cherry on top, Luke Skywalker himself, Mark Hamill as Goro Majima. Every time I look at this cast list, I see someone new. Did you know Cam Clark, the voice of Liquid Snake, plays Kage's son? Or that Carrie Walgren, the voice of Haruko in FLCL, has a small role? The casting was insane. But what's even more insane is that even with all these amazing names, it turned out to be one of the worst dubs in history. Ah, uh, you wacko fuck! Don't be talking that shit unless you go back that shit up! There are a lot of contributing factors. For one, the translation just isn't very good. This is coming from someone who doesn't speak Japanese, but the amount of swearing alone is hilarious. Some lines will have three or four swears for no apparent reason. Then you've got the weird sound problems, resulting in one of my favorite lines in video game history. Go! Kill this arrogant motherfucker! On top of that, you've got some characters like Kiryu giving very understated performances, while Mark Hamill is just doing his thing, despite the fact that he apparently doesn't even remember doing it. <laughs> this is the part where you're supposed to laugh! Laugh, you stupid motherfucker! This release didn't live up to Sega's expectations, and it's surprising that Yakuza 2 ever even made it across, even if it did take almost two years. Despite its awfulness, and the fact that it nearly destroyed the series over here, I have a soft spot for the dub. I'm very happy they never dubbed the sequel, or any of the other games for a decade and a half, but I'm glad we have this one. It's a nice time capsule to show what game localizations were like back in the mid-aughts. Seeing as I can't speak Japanese, my only option was to replay the dub. And I don't resent that. After all, that's the version I first played all those years ago. Surely something won't come out of nowhere and make the dub completely redundant. <laughs> 
Daikamou! So yeah, a couple weeks after I finished my initial replay, Yakuza Restored was released. Not only a full undub of Yakuza on PS2, but also a revised translation with correct titles that match the later entries. As much as I love the dub in a so bad it's good way, the biggest issue with it is its inaccuracies. The translation is shoddy, and for some reason they changed a few of the character names. For example, Kage the Florist, as he's known in English, should really just be called Hanaya. For whatever reason they gave him this name, it stuck for the rest of the English translations for consistency's sake. Another great example is Kiryu's Oyabun Shintaro Kazuma, who they renamed to Shintaro Fuma for some unknown reason. This only gets more confusing when you play games like Zero or the Kiwami remakes, where the original Japanese names are kept as they are. For the sake of consistency, I'll be using the proper Japanese names for these videos. So while I fully believe the dub is worth preserving and experiencing, now that we have a proper undub available, I'm not sure what's really recommend. Hopefully by the end of this video I'll have convinced you to try the game for yourself, and at least now you'll have the option. With all that setup established, let's talk about the meat of Yakuza. The story. The game begins in 1995 with Kazuma Kiryu, a member of the Dojima family. Kiryu's character develops pretty drastically over the course of the series, but even in his first outing, he's remarkably similar. Kiryu lost his parents at a young age and was raised in Sunflower Orphanage alongside his friend Nishiki and his love interest Yumi. He looked up to the man who took him in, Shintaro Kazuma, captain of the Dojima family, and grew up to become a Yakuza. While Kiryu's backstory is expanded upon in later games and prequels, this part of his life stays the same. He grew up aspiring to be like Kazuma, and when the game begins, he's being considered as the captain of a new family. A good example of Kiryu's character comes in our first piece of gameplay. Shinji, a lieutenant in the Dojima family, joins Kiryu on a debt collection job. He warns Kiryu that the guys they're collecting from are loan sharks, and that things might get violent. When they enter the room to find the group packing their bags, Kiryu asks them for the money, delivering another classic dub line. When you don't pay your debts, I'm what you get. The leader then begs Kiryu not to kill them, saying that the Dojima family collects their debts at the end of a gun barrel. Kiryu's reaction makes it clear that he's not a murderer, he's just here to get what he's owed. Even after they attack him and Shinji finds the money hidden in a briefcase, Kiryu doesn't go any further and lets them live. Kiryu represents an idealistic version of the Yakuza. He believes in honor and strength, and he's got a heart of gold underneath his gruff exterior. He returns to Serena, the bar where his friend Reina works, and has a drink with Nishiki and Yumi before returning the money to the Dojima office. Once he hands the money over to Kazuma, he receives a call from Shinji, saying that Sohei Dojima, the patriarch of the Dojima family, kidnapped Yumi, and Nishiki was already chasing after them. Panicking, Kiryu heads over to his office and finds Nishiki standing over the body of their patriarch. Knowing what would happen if he was caught, Kiryu tells Nishiki to take Yumi and leave, taking the fall so his sworn brother could escape. Kiryu is then arrested, exiled from the Tojo clan, and spends 10 years in jail. Now, in 2005, Kiryu sees just how much Kamurocho has changed. His friends are few and far between, the years he spent away having changed them drastically. Nishiki took Kiryu's spot and created a new family, becoming a ruthless leader, and Yumi is nowhere to be found. Yakuza games tend to have two layers to their stories, a large conspiracy that threatens to destroy the Tojo clan, and a personal, character-driven story. In this game, 10 billion yen has gone missing from the Tojo clan vault, plunging them into chaos as each family attempts to find the money and gain control. The personal story is about Kiryu's relationship with a girl named Haruka and his quest to find Yumi. As Kiryu comes to grips with the world around him, he begins his search by finding out how many allies he has left in the city. One of his closest friends, Shinji, now works for the Nishiki family. However, he remains a Kazuma loyalist in secret, and helps Kiryu out whenever he can. He also manages to forge an unlikely friendship with Detective Makoto Date. Date is one of my favourite Yakuza characters. He's one of the few introduced in this game that manages to appear in every numbered entry that stars Kiryu. He never believed that Kiryu murdered Dojima, and continued investigating investigating after he was incarcerated. When he notices the activity buzzing around the Tojo clan when Kiryu was released from prison, he offers to help him find Yumi and discover the truth behind the 10 billion yen. Date quickly becomes Kiryu's closest ally. He's disillusioned with the police of Kamurocho, especially after they transferred him to organized crime for sniffing around the Dojima murder too much, and feels that the 10 billion yen will lead them to uncovering corruption that might go right to the top. 
While Kiryu's friends are few and far between, his enemies are staggering. Every Yakuza in town knows about the Dragon of Dojima, the man who murdered his own patriarch, and they'll take any opportunity to take his head. A lot of the higher-ups in the Tojo clan are admittedly a little one-note in this one, however, they are fleshed out in later entries. Shimano is a great example of this. In this game, Shimano is a greedy, abusive captain who rules by fear. He has no qualms with openly seeking the 10 billion and wanting to take over the Tojo clan, and goes out of his way to hunt down Kiryu. He's one of those Yakuza villains, the ones that exist exclusively to be a boss fight later on. I see. Kazuma has returned. <laughs> Among the characters introduced in his first outing, there's one we can't ignore, the character responsible for thousands of people getting into the series, Goro Majima. Majima is a complex character to discuss, mainly because he has arguably the most drastic development throughout the series. If you're aware of him, it's probably from later games where he becomes a playable character, or from the remake of Yakuza 1, which is a whole other topic entirely that we'll get into in another video. This isn't to say that Majima in the original is a joke character either, because he's really not. Majima is the loose canon of the series. He's got more than a few screws loose, and even though we don't know why he acts this way in the first entry, he's still got some depth. We're first introduced to him before Kiryu goes to prison, and he's shown assaulting one of his goons for not showing Kiryu proper respect. This is the crux of their relationship. Majima reveres Kiryu for his brute strength, but they each have very different opinions on how to run a family. When Kiryu is let out of prison, Majima sees his opportunity to finally fight Kiryu one on one, and he goes out of his way to make sure it happens. This relationship continues throughout the series. They are rivals to the end. Even during times of peace, Majima expects everything to be resolved with a fist fight. Kiryu seems annoyed at first by Majima, unable to understand his reasoning, but he quickly learns that he doesn't have to worry about him. He's not an enemy sent by the Tojo clan to kill Kiryu, he simply does it because he respects Kiryu's strength. There's one more very important character left. After prison, Kiryu visits some informants, meets old allies, sneaks into a funeral, and eventually gets a tip that a local bar might know where Yumi is. When he enters, he finds the owner and patrons murdered, and a young girl shell-shocked behind the counter. For as much as Yakuza is about punching things really hard, a long-standing theme in the series is family, and nowhere is this better exemplified than in the relationship between Kiryu and Haruka. From this moment on, Haruka is a mainstay in the Yakuza games, driving Kiryu's decisions and keeping him grounded. But as of right now, she's just a scared young girl who left an orphanage looking for her mother. Being the lovable guy he is, Kiryu decides to take her to a safe place and look after her, only to discover that her mother Mizuki is Yumi's younger sister, and she has a connection to the mystery of the 10 billion yen. Haruka quickly becomes the emotional core of the game, as Kiryu learns more about her and ultimately becomes very protective of her. Despite being a very young child, she managed to survive all alone in Kamurocho before meeting Kiryu, and she's not content with just sitting back while Kiryu searches for her mother. Haruka is probably the best payoff for playing the Yakuza games from the beginning, as you get to see her grow and change through the years, along with how her relationship with Kiryu develops. While she mainly exists as part of the story, she also has her own gameplay system. At certain points in the game, Kiryu can bring Haruka out into the city to explore with her. You can win toys for her in crane games, bring her food, and just hang out with her. While it isn't exactly fleshed out in this game, it does help to sell their relationship a lot better, and it also leads us on to our next section, exploring the city of Kamurocho. No matter how much the series has changed, or how many different cities the cast visit, Kamurocho is the heart and soul of the franchise. The city is based on Tokyo's real-life Kabukicho district, an area known for its nightlife and shady dealings, which makes it the perfect setting for a series like this. While it's not a one-to-one -one scale replica, a lot of the major monuments are there. The red neon entrance sign on Tenkaichi Street, Theater Square, even the placement of shops like Donkey are shockingly accurate to the real-world equivalent. While in later games you have multiple cities to explore and tons of mini-games, the first entry focuses more on getting the feel of Kamurocho right. Going back to it after all these years, there's something I miss about the PS2 Kamurocho. While it retains its layout for the most part, the later games show a much cleaner version of the city. In its first appearance, it's filthy. Everything is dark. The public spaces are filled with homeless people, burning bins, shady alleyways with dodgy characters hanging around. It feels much more dangerous. A lot of this 
this has to do with how the series evolves, and I'll get more into that in later videos, but as the city grows and the police clamp down on the Yakuza, Kamurocho does become cleaner and more high-tech. But back in 2005, the Yakuza still had a major grip on districts like Kamurocho, and you can see that very clearly in its first appearance. Whether it's host clubs charging exorbitant prices, or Yakuza demanding protection money, Kamurocho is a dirty city. But that's not to say that it's all grime. Sure, the streets may be filthy, but inside the host bars, everything is gold and pristine. Purgatory is a perfect example of this. Right in the top corner of Kamurocho, there's a massive public park that has been claimed by the homeless population of the city, and it looks about as ramshackle as you can imagine. But beneath it lies the real purgatory, a decadent underground street modelled after a traditional Japanese pleasure district. This is what I miss about the PS2 Kamurocho, back when the dirt and grime of the town hit its true beauty, and not the other way around. Yakuza Zero touches on this as well, another time period when the Tojo clan were so brazen and powerful that they didn't even bother hiding their influence over the city. Kamurocho is alive. People wander the streets, you see flashes of conversation that tell you a little bit more about what it's like to live in a place like this. There's something else about Kamurocho that I normally don't like in media, and that's product placement. In order to recreate Kabukicho accurately, a lot of things like shops and arcades had to be copied over too, which is why places like Don Quixote are carbon copies of their real life counterparts. This extends much further than just signs and logos. If you visit any of the bars in Kamurocho, you can drink multiple name brand whiskies or beers, and then afterwards, when you're nice and merry, stumble on down to the arcade in Theatre Square and play some crane games in the Sega Arcade. Normally, product placement in games smacks you across the face and screams, we like money, but in Yakuza, where the idea is to be as authentic as possible, it doesn't feel out of place. This isn't Big Boss creating Axe Body Spray in the 1970s. It feels natural. Later on in the series, a lot of these places are replaced or outright removed, presumably for copyright reasons. But I miss walking down Nakamichi Street and hearing the little donkey theme song coming from the street corner. It adds to the atmosphere rather than takes away from it. Here you can explore Kamurocho freely, visiting shops, restaurants, arcades, but along the way he might run into some trouble. Whether it's Tojo Clan members out for blood, con men looking to swindle people, or just some bored thugs, everyone wants a piece of Kiryu. Which brings us to the combat. Combat is very important to the Yakuza series. While there are some outliers, the majority of them are 3D beat-em-ups. You run into someone on the street, slam their head into the nearest solid object, get some XP and money, and continue on your journey. Later games would take steps to make the encounters feel more natural, but for the most part, this core gameplay loop has remained. Another thing that remains the same is Kiryu's fighting style. The combat in the first entry is very stripped back. Kiryu doesn't have multiple styles, instead having a single moveset. The more you level up different aspects of his character, the more moves he learns or healthy gains. Kiryu's handy punch-kick combos remain almost the same for a decade, and while it may not be the most exciting moveset, it does offer some nice utility. In the beginning of the game, your options in combat are very limited. You've got light and heavy attacks, a dash, a block, and a grab. That's about it. You'll pretty quickly learn what the best combos are. In the early game, I was a big fan of the square-square plus triangle, which gives you a body hit that can break enemy guards, but doesn't knock them down, allowing you to quickly follow up with a long combo. Eventually, you meet Komaki, Kiryu's trusty mentor, and he offers to teach you new moves if you keep leveling up and getting stronger. Once Komaki deems you worthy, he teaches you useful mechanics, like better dodges, a parry, and the famous tiger drop a move that basically obliterates 90% of the game. By pressing attack as an enemy is about to hit you, Kiryu counters with a low hit. This basically gives your offensive skills a defensive ability as well, making spamming attacks a lot less dangerous. I highly recommend training with Komaki if you're finding the gameplay a little bit lacking. Things like weapon move sets are hidden behind his teachings. While I'll admit the early game is pretty boring in the fighting department, the game does get a lot more fun when you have your whole move set. However, there are definitely some kinks in the game systems, and they're just something you'll have to learn as you play. If you've ever watched someone play Yakuza on PS2, you'll probably notice they tend to go past enemies quite often. While you may be quick to judge and wonder how they keep missing, a lot of that is down to the way the game works. Kiryu controls pretty well in the overworld, and even in combat, while he's a little bit stiff, 
He's not horrific. The issue is that once Kiryu starts attacking, he follows a very straight path, and there's really no way to stop him until he finishes his animation. This would be fine if the enemy is against a wall, or if they're being pushed along by the force of his punches, but a lot of the time, enemies will either fall out of your combo, or you'll just completely miss them. And if you've already input the combo you planned on doing, Kiryu is left vulnerable and unable to block. This is easily the most frustrating part of the game's combat, and it's got first entry problems written all over it. Even the sequel, which is very similar to one, improves this combat system in little ways that makes a huge difference. One thing that is cool, however, are Kiryu's trademark heat moves. By landing enough hits, this blue meter beneath Kiryu's health builds up, and once you have enough, you unlock special attacks that do a ton of damage. Heat is another thing that works very differently in the PS2 games. For one, in the later entries, once you build up heat, it remains in your stock until you choose to use it. Here, the meter depletes as long as Kiryu isn't fighting, or if he takes damage, which means that if you build it up and get knocked down, you're more than likely gonna lose most of it by the time you stand back up. This makes it feel more like a combo meter rather than just an EX bar. In order to use it, you have to keep up momentum and spend it when you get it, rather than saving it up for a big attack. Kiryu's actual list of heat moves is a lot slimmer in this one. Most of them involve finding parts of the environment rather than specific actions. While it's not my favorite implementation of the heat system, it's not terrible either. It just makes you play the game with a different mindset. For the most part, your time fighting random goons on the street will be relatively easy. The real issue comes from boss fights. I'll be honest, Yakuza as a series has never really been about the boss fights themselves. Most of the time, the reason people remember a boss is because of the story or cutscenes surrounding them, rather than cool, intense gameplay. In the original Yakuza, the boss fights are no different. They're either really easy or really annoying. A lot of them will immediately break out of grabs, armor through your punches, and are typically a lot more mobile than Kiryu. Also, God help you if they have a gun. Most of the really tough fights involve chipping away at the enemy once they lower their guard, or catching them in the middle of a big attack animation. I will say though, a lot of these criticisms are redundant once you unlock the tiger drop, at which point you can pretty much spam whatever and still interrupt their attacks. I think the best way to sum up the combat as a whole in this game is that it feels like they had the basics of a good combat system down, but not the experience or time to implement it perfectly, which is why there's such a significant difference between each entry as the team gets more comfortable developing the series. I have a real soft spot for janky PS2 combat, so I'm always a bit more lenient on the game's flaws. Of course, there were times where I wanted to scream at Kiryu to stop missing enemies, but I think if you have patience, you should be able to learn how to live with the little issues. The game is also really generous when it comes to money, so as long as you visit Kotobuki often enough, you should be able to down Staminans through any fight. Because this is a retrospective and Yakuza is a story-heavy franchise, I'm gonna go into some spoilers here, but because I want this video to also work as an entry-level guide to the series, here's the timestamp you should go to if you don't want to hear any spoilers. You've been warned. The bulk of Yakuza's story revolves around the 10 billion yen that's gone missing from the Tojo clan vault, but like every one of these games, that's only the tip of the iceberg. I'll be the first to admit that the first entry isn't the greatest story in the franchise. It has its moments for sure, but being the first game means it has the tall task of introducing dozens of characters, some of which really don't get the time needed to shine. After Nishiki calls an emergency meeting with the Tojo clan captains and explains the situation of the 10 billion yen, all the major leaders begin scrambling to find it. Almost immediately after this announcement, Chairman Sarah is found dead, leaving a vacuum of power waiting to be filled. Of course, this wouldn't be a Yakuza game if this was as deep as it went. While Kiryu searches for Yumi, Date tries his best to use his police resources to investigate, but constantly runs up against brick walls as his superiors tell him to lay off the case. The reason why, which is revealed late into the game, is that the current Yakuza problems have a connection to Kyohei Jingu, a politician with a shady past. Yakuza games tend to have two types of villains, ambitious Yakuza with a dream of taking over, or a corrupt politician or cop who is incredibly evil. This game happens to include both of these. While Nishiki remains the primary villain of Kiryu's story, Jingu is the real puppet master behind the scenes. We learn that after Dojima was shot, Yumi went into shock and lost all of her memories, which led to her running away from the hospital and disappearing. During this time, she meets Jingu, becomes pregnant, and gives birth to Haruka. 
Naraka. While Yumi wanted to raise Haruka, Jingu had very different plans, and began seeing the Prime Minister's daughter. However, his connection doesn't stop there. The 10 billion yen in the Tojo clan vault was actually Jingu's money, and he'd been using Sarah and the Yakuza to help launder it. Later, Realizing that his pre-marital life may come back to haunt him, he asks Sarah to have an assassin kill Yumi and Haruka, but Kazuma stops him. The gunshots reawakened Yumi's trauma, and her memories resurfaced. Realizing that Haruka was in danger as long as Jingu was around, Kazuma takes her to Sunflower Orphanage, and helps Yumi take on a new identity as Mizuki. After seeing the lengths Jingu will go to, Kazuma, Yumi, and Sarah decide to expose him by stealing the 10 billion yen, bringing us back to the start of the game. I'll be honest, Jingu is probably the least interesting part of the game. His actions are almost laughably evil, and he's one of those Yakuza villains that only appears in the 11th hour just to explain the complicated web of conspiracies. He's such a non-entity that even the live-action movie just has him get shot while he's in the helicopter on the way to Millennium Tower, and he doesn't even have a single line. Not to say the live-action movie is accurate in any way, but this is one change I think they made the right decision on. The true villain of Yakuza is Nishiki. Kiryu's sworn brother turned bitter rival. Nishiki is probably the most unfortunate part of this game, because a lot of his depth is implied rather than shown. Nishiki always felt like he was in Kiryu's shadow. Before he went to prison, Kiryu was more than likely getting his own family. He had everything Nishiki wanted. Even their tattoos are a perfect match. Kiryu's back features a dragon, whereas Nishiki's is a koi. While Kiryu has already reached his dragon, Nishiki still hasn't climbed the waterfall in order to transform. He's constantly chasing him. After the events of 1995, Nishiki would eventually get what he wanted, but only after losing everything. Kiryu was in prison, Yumi had gone missing, and most tragically, his sister died during a life-saving surgery. Realizing that he had nothing left, Nishiki became bitter and remorseless, climbing the ranks of the Tojo clan until he eventually reached the point we see him in now, a ruthless leader who will do anything to get by. On paper, this is completely understandable, and it makes their final confrontation extremely bittersweet. The problem is that, in practice, Nishiki is barely on screen for the the majority of the game, and a lot of this development is either inferred or told through conversations that Nishiki isn't present for. Again, this is another video entirely, but the one thing I can really praise Kuami for is the additional Nishiki cutscenes that flesh him out a lot better. While the story remains largely the same, we get to at least see how the 10 year time skip affected him, and what he went through. This especially helps because if you were someone who started with Yakuza 0, like a lot of people did, you'd probably be very confused about Nishiki's actions. While I'm happy Nishiki got more development later, I still don't think the original is completely irredeemable or anything. His story still helps to highlight the game's major theme, and it does a much better job of bridging Kiryu's personal story with the Tojo clan conspiracy than Jingu ever could. Speaking of themes, like I said earlier, Yakuza as a series touches on many different things, which makes sense for a series this long, but at the heart of the mainline entries is Kazuma Kiryu, and I would argue the primary theme of his story is family. Family is what drives Kiryu's actions throughout the entire series, and it's in the first entry where we see why it's so important to him. We've already mentioned how Kiryu is an orphan, and in the beginning of the game we meet his found family, a ragtag gang who all grew up in Sunflower Orphanage. He plans on proposing to Yumi, Nishiki is his sworn brother, and Reina is the older sister type, looking after the group and keeping them together. His father figure, Kazuma, is one of the few men Kiryu trusts unquestionably. The only the reason Kiryu spends 10 years in prison is because he wants to protect his family, and the only reason Nishiki kills Dojima is because he was a threat to Yumi. By taking the fall for Nishiki, Kiryu is expelled from the only real group he belongs to, the Dojima family, and no one is allowed to contact him, not even Kazuma. Kiryu eventually leaves prison to a life without a support system. Because of his reputation as a traitor, he can't walk up to Kazuma and talk to him, and the only friendly person left in the city is Reina. This doesn't last too long. Kiryu begins gathering allies like Date and the Florist, but his goal of finding Yumi and confronting Nishiki remains the same. Even his new allies all tie into this theme. Both Date and Kage have side stories that appear during the main storyline. In Kage's case, we discover that he has a son named Takashi. When his mother died, Kage left him, presumably doubting his ability to raise a child by himself. 
Instead, the informant uses his city surveillance and connections to keep an eye on him from a distance, and one day discovers that Takashi is dating the daughter of a Yakuza leader from the Atobe family. After mistaking Kiryu for a Yakuza, Takashi informs him that they plan on running away together and starting a new life, as Kyoka's father won't accept him. After finding her and proving his worth, the Atobe captain reads a note from her father, giving his blessing to leave with Takashi. Kage and Atobe discuss their children, lamenting that they haven't done enough for them in the past. That's quite a son you have. Only because I didn't raise him. Same here. Later, Kiryu sees Detective Date asleep at the counter after a long day of drinking alone at Serena. Reina had been lending him an ear when he mentioned his daughter, Saya. His phone rings, and since he's fast asleep, Kiryu answers it to hear a young girl shouting about how he always stands her up. He decides to find her, hoping to mend the relationship between the father and daughter, but instead discovers that Saya is selling herself. Saya has been dating a host named Shota, and racked up an incredible amount of debt, on top of him asking her to make money for him. Once Date finds out, he confronts her in Stardust, and the two have a heated exchange. You're trying to act like a father now? You stood me up today, remember? Saya hates her father, and believes that Shota loves her, when in reality, he's working alongside the loan sharks who she owes money to. His plan is to force her to make porn in order to pay off her debt, but once Date finds where they are, he runs to stop them. The gang beat up Date and try to get money from him. He refuses to make a deal, and tells them to kill him. Date was happy knowing that Saya would be safe with Kiryu, and that if he died, the police would do everything they could to find them. Once she sees the lengths her father will go to save her, and Date realizes how poor of a father he's been, the two reconcile and he promises to always protect her. Throughout both of these stories, Kiryu sees the regrets of two men that ran away from their families and the consequences of those actions. Kiryu didn't have a choice when he went to prison, and the one person he wants to protect more than anything is missing. While Date and Kage both get to watch their children grow, Kiryu's family crumbles around him. A bit more than halfway through the game, Kiryu discovers that Reina has been feeding information to Nishiki, which explains how he managed to always stay one step ahead. Remorseful over what she's done, she decides to help Kiryu and turns on Nishiki. Soon after, he has her killed in front of Kiryu, along with one of his oldest allies, Shinji. Next, he discovers that Kazuma is hiding out on a boat in the docks, and visits him in order to retrieve Chairman Sarah's will. But they're attacked by Shimano, and Kazuma sacrifices himself to save Kiryu and Haruka. In the final confrontation, Yumi takes a bullet for Kiryu, and Nishiki kills himself in order to destroy the Ten Billion and kill Jingu. Yumi dies in Kiryu's arms as the rooftop of Millennium Tower is turned to rubble. Kiryu's family is destroyed and taken from him piece by piece. Regardless of how the last ten years had changed them, he still loved them. The final boss theme says it all, for whose sake. Kiryu spent ten years in prison, lost everyone he held dear over the greed of others, and in the end, was left with nothing. When it seems like all is lost and he's ready to give up and let the police arrest him, Date says this. Stand up and protect the one thing worth fighting for. Don't run away. Kiryu may have lost his family, but he found a new one. If he was to go back to prison, everything he fought for would be in vain, and Haruka would be left alone in a world without a family, just as he was. With a renewed purpose, Kiryu leaves Millennium Tower with a new goal. As far as the Tojo conspiracy goes, Chairman Sarah's will had actually been left blank, trusting Kazuma to choose his successor as head of the Tojo clan. While it allowed Kiryu to clear his name as a murderous traitor, he isn't built for sitting in board meetings and running the entire organization, so he's sworn in as chairman of the Tojo clan, and resigns in the same day, thus allowing him to live a normal life as a civilian. As we now know, trouble doesn't exactly leave Kiryu alone for long, but for now, he gets to begin a new chapter of his life. There are so many more things I could talk about with this game, and if I were to do so, this video would probably be three hours long. Characters like Shinji and Reina, who deserved more discussion, and others like Kashiwagi and Tarada that become important players later on. How the game just feels different compared to the rest of the series. How cinematic the cutscenes are. How even the lighting is completely different. With all that said, I've decided that there's one more thing that deserves special recognition. You may have noticed that, throughout the footage I've used, 
there's some Christmas related imagery. Yakuza is one of those series that takes place during the time of its release, and most of the games tend to release in either December or March. As the series goes on, this becomes a lot less important, but for Yakuza 1 and 2, the time period feels especially poignant. I've always considered the series festive and Christmassy, not just because Saejima dresses up in a Santa costume and rolls people up into snowmen, but because it just feels cozy. Sure, the series is dark. Kiryu is constantly surrounded by death and violence, but he always stands up and fights for the people he loves, often at the expense of his own health. Kiryu's heart is far bigger than his muscles, and it just feels oddly fitting that the majority of the games take place during a season based on forgiveness and generosity. Next in this series, I'll be discussing Yakuza 2, a game that is near and dear to my heart. So, I hope you join me, whenever that will be, in following the adventures of Kazuma Kiryu. Thanks for watching. This is the longest video I've done in years, so if you've made it this far, I really can't thank you enough. If you want more videos like this, please leave a comment and let me know. I have no idea when the next one will be, so be sure to subscribe so you'll be alerted when it happens. My socials and tip jar are also in the description if you feel like checking those out. Anyways, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you real soon.